Hello, this is the first entry in a series I will likely do on and off. If you're wondering, wait, nothing is really moving, don't worry. This is more of a review slash podcast. As over the years when painting or working on projects, or just kind of playing certain relaxing games, I found I enjoyed a certain passive, easygoing kind of video. These videos are usually long and kind of very simple visually, and I like the idea. But when it came to other stuff like games or films or anime, I felt you kind of needed a visual element to present and communicate things. So when I finished reading this book and I wanted to do a video on it, it seemed kind of great. After all, books already have no images and force you to imagine them. And so a casual video being more of a sort of one-man podcast or review seemed a pretty solid fit. Otherwise, I don't know, I'd just be kind of showing you random images and... So I'm just going to leave you with the headers and the timestamps instead. So feel free, put this on, I'll tab over to Minecraft or Factorio, or get back to painting or writing some essay. Uh, general spoilery talk ensues, but nothing too specific for the most part. And so yeah, let's get into the book. So Old Venus. Firstly, I think it's useful to get a little bit of background on me, and a little bit of background on G.R.R. Martin's broad kind of history with science fiction. Martin at this point is famously known as being behind the hit Game of Thrones, or as it's known to the fans, a Song of Ice and Fire series of books. This naturally made Martin heavily associated with fantasy. However, Martin had long written science fiction, for decades before Game of Thrones would ever be televised. Some of his works, like the short novel Sand Kings, won awards such as The Nebula. I know it's a little ironic, but it kind of shows something more interesting. Martin's approach to fantasy was always influenced by this, a very science fiction mindset, to always make things kind of explainable with science, even if it's never done outright. And so this kind of gave his flavor of fantasy something very distinct, and it's a very, very different approach to something like Tolkien's language professor slash mythologist kind of style of writing. Many of Martin's works are actually in a single universe or setting, The Thousand Worlds. If you want a great review of those works, and the same review which basically hooked me into reading all of them, look up Preston Jacobs' YouTube channel. He has a great review series and book club on them, and it's just a really fun time. Also, if you read them all, I think you get a free sandwich. So as strange as it initially seems, Martin is a good fit for science fiction as he actually has a longer, if albeit overshadowed, history involved with it, and with his hybrid science fiction fantasy stories. Now importantly, he's not the writer here. He's merely the editor and the collection overseer along with Gardner Dozois. But the main point is the guy has chops when it comes to SF. Dozois was an editor and a man I will want to talk of later for his work on The Year's Best Science Fiction, a very important book series for me. But that's for another video, really. As for myself, to give some background, I love books. And I will probably surprise zero people when I say I've read copious amounts of science fiction. More or less between the ages of somewhere around, I want to say, 9 or 10, all the way up to my current age, I would read at least 6 to 12 books a year, and a good number of them were science fiction. Sometimes I would go for a few months or weeks burning through multiple books in a series. At the point of my glory days, I could knock out something like 200 pages a night, but that's long since gone. This is also ironically what led me through to anime and mecha anime in a big way. I was always furiously hungry for some cool damn ideas, and books had them in spades, but I would also then seek out movies and shows that complemented that. So I would go through a huge cyberpunk phase, reading all of Gibson's works, and then Snow Crash by Neil Stevenson, and then I would end up, you know, looking up Ghost in the Shell, the TV show, for a visual interpretation of the ideas that I had already read about. Similarly, I remember reading through Golden Age SF, like the Empire series by Asimov, and then I would dive right into Legend of the Galactic Heroes, and so on. So I've read a fair a bit basically, but my taste was not limited to that. And thanks to a particularly cool high school creative writing teacher, I have since expanded into many weird and wonderful genres of books and fiction. Now, as for this book, I need to specifically mention something. I fucking love short story compilations. Short story clusters are great. They're this kind of cornucopia of many short, rapid-fire slices of ideas and settings. You can love one story, hate the next, think the next is boring, and I just kind of love that variety. With bigger books, you might never be sure how you feel, or it might take you a while to warm up to one, or you might love the initial story but hate the ending, but short stories never have this. To this day, one of my all-time favorite science fiction stories, Who's Afraid of Wolf 359 by Ken McLeod, is, if I remember right, barely a few pages in length. 
So, as I already a fan of, you know, the format and of Martin's works as a writer, I was naturally curious about this book and the collection he would edit together, and when I saw it at a half-price books on vacation a few months ago, I picked it up. So, Old Venus. Old Venus is the second entry into a series initially begun with the previous collection organized by Martin. Old Mars, which I have not read. But in concept alone, I adored it as soon as I read the jacket. The idea is simple. Ignore what we do know about Venus, about it being an unlivable hellhole that would melt you down to a puddle in minutes. Don't terraform it. Just accept the possibility of a warm, wet world covered in plant life, the way we already once did. Accept that, and then using some prompts, write a story set there, here, in a near future, in the past, but inevitably on Venus. If there is one thing that staggeringly had me right away, it was just the concept. I grew up on science. I love accurate portrayals and realistic science fiction. And it's still, I'm one of those people who can look at a spaceship from a movie and within about 9 seconds tell you every which way it could need improvement for scientific realism. And unfortunately, after years of studying art, I can also now do the same thing, but for aesthetic purposes as well. So yeah, I'm very analytical. But as a byproduct of this, I kind of grew fascinated by anachronistic portrayals of worlds. Worlds where, you know what? Fuck science. You just don't care about it. You want to write something cool. Something, you know, a world where it's far more Indiana Jones and the adventures are really that kind of caliber. Just a fun time. Mars, Venus, Jupiter, just the imagined versions of these places of a Mars filled with canals and plains and a Venus that's hot and stormy but inhospitable to some degree. And of course, both filled with barbarian races and advanced technology and endless supply of space ultra-hot mega-babes. Something about it is just, it's so ironic when juxtaposed with the practical hellscape of Venus and the cold, thin-aired, irradiated desert of Mars that we have in real life. It's kind of like learning there was this whole genre of fiction describing a continent at the bottom of the world to be a veritable Disneyland of pleasure and happiness, only for a few dozen frozen Norwegians to basically prove that nothing was there, well, except for some penguins, basically. So the idea, the concept of using the anachronistic concept of these worlds, and in this case Venus, and I'm pretty sure just giving the writers an identical setup of some kind of strong writing points like jungle, Soviet involvement related to their real-life Venera probes, colonialism, kind of. And it's a kind of fascinating idea for a setup. Venus especially has always also had to play second fiddle to Mars as a cool setting, and it's really kind of a sad thing. As well, at the end of reading this collection, and as a sort of test of the setup myself, I wrote a short story also set along the same concepts, while trying to make as well what I felt was a good use of the world and the ideas. I tried to make it at least better than the stories I hated, and I think I did well, but I also have no idea how good my writing is personally, so yeah. There's a link to the story in the description down below. I would be interested in feedback down in the comments on both this video's style and the story if you happen to read it. As for the results within the collection, they are, well, varied, each presenting a very similar but also different version of Venus. And so without any further setup, let's dive in and go through all the stories in this collection. I will only briefly summarize maybe bits and pieces. It's not going to be very thorough in the kind of write-up of Wikipedia summary sense. And so, yeah, let's get into it. So, Gardner Dozois gives us a nice little introduction on the planet and the history of its imagined form and literature the genre of planetary romance, and just how scientific probes largely squash that, and how this book is a kind of attempt at a subversion of that reality with a return to that romantic past. So this takes us on to the first story, Frogheads by Alan M. Steele. Steele is, like many authors in here, not one I'm outwardly familiar with. The story had the somewhat funny bonus of being read by me on a delayed flight back home, and also starting with a rough-and-tumble transit into Venus by the main character. It's a sort of pseudo-noir story. It focuses on detectives tracking down a rich Earth playboy who has gone missing on the wet, swampy world of Venus. All in all, I think the story serves as a pretty good intro to the main writing prompts Martin probably gave out to the writers. Wet. Hot. Muggy raining and with, you know, extra bits of the Soviet colonization attempt at Venus. The story is, altogether, pretty okay. It's narrative about the central frog people natives largely addicted to chocolate and angry at Earthmen who have come and basically now ransack and cut down and mine their planet for resources, though, is... well, I've been here before. As is their eventual quasi-revenge on the young playboy. After reading enough of these kinds of stories, they all sort of blur together into one. After reading something like The Word for World is Forest by Ursula K. Le Guin, you kind of have a template. Ironically, Martin's own story, and Seven Times Never Kill Man, 
is itself probably one of my favorite insidious versions of this western colonial guilt slash ecological destruction type setup. But don't take this as really anything too critical, it's a solid first story, it's just riding some familiar rails for me. Story number two is The Drowned Celestial by La Vie Tidar. It's an unapologetic planetary romance story. It's a pure pulp, as expected of something where the main character is named fucking Colt. It's fun, there are cyborgs and whiz-bang action with some slight overtones of the themes of Old Venus. Largely I can't say it's bad, but it's also not particularly memorable, largely because of how closely it dives into the conventions of that style. I really don't have much more to say on it unless you wanted me to count the number of punches the main character throws or how many laser bullets he shoots. Story 3 is Planet of Fear by Paul McCauley. This story turns the Soviet writing prompts up to 11, and I kinda dig it. You have a giant Ekranoplan, ground effect vehicle, Soviet resource operations on a muddy, murky, foggy world. The story's whole setup was kinda giving me flashbacks to Solaris by Tarkovsky. A story about Soviet colonies, Russian expeditions venturing into a camp of workers, seemingly beset by a mysterious disease causing madness, suicidal craziness, and paranoia. It's a time-tested convention going back all the way through Forbidden Planet to much older sources. Many characters approach the would-be problem with this usual, you got a hot-headed guy, and the expedition members who are more reserved and, you know, paranoid, and the main character who tries to take a more scientific approach to how to make sense of it all. I think this one hit the atmosphere solidly. Like the literal atmosphere of Venus, its descriptions seem to hit home. If only because mentally I have a good image of Tarkovsky's stalker and nostalgia. Just the sense of a very smoky, foggy place. As for the central mystery of what is attacking the camp they find, eh, it was okay. It had a reasonable twist reveal, and I'd say it's another good entry into the collection, but not really one that blew me away. Okay, I kind of fucking hated number four. Okay, I know, I'm sorry, but yeah, this one was largely pretty painful. Greaves and the Morning Star by Matthew Hughes is... Uh, I get it. Planetary romance novels were basically written around the late, you know, 1800s and early 1900s, so the idea of an overly wordy, in that British parlance Victorian style adventure on Venus... I get the setup, but god damn it hurt to read. <laughs> Even though Matthew Hughes is English and from Liverpool, it felt like I was reading a slightly above average reddit r slash steampunk tier shit effort. It also feels like it just went on and on really. I'm sure someone out there loves endless butler master dialogue of Ooh, Alfred, I do, and I think I'm hungry sir, I shall galvanize the occasion with a spot of Cointreau, but it ain't me. I honestly could barely get into the actual story, that dialogue was like driving over a road made from smashed china teacups in a car with flat tires, it, just fucking painful. On the complete opposite end, and kind of a proof of what I love short story collections for, number 5, A Planet Called Desire by Gwyneth Jones ended up being hands down one of my favorites. On the surface it takes the planetary romance setup and runs with it to a new, exciting kind of story. The setup of a fearless affluent adventurer casting off the decadent, crumbling earth to be teleported back to a primordial, soon to be doomed climatologically, ancient Venus. It's got adventure, it's got romance, but it's also got one of the more interesting visualizations of Venus beyond simply the, it's a swamp jungle, the previous stories seem to stick to. It's got the vibrant culture that was a key part of stories like the classic John Carter books, but with a level of somewhat political intrigue. It really hit that good mix in, a, really in my book, of a space adventure where it takes itself seriously enough that it does not fall into the almost self-parody of pulp that we now kind of associate culturally with that style, but that usually, un, you know, unsurprisingly, undercuts it. So yeah, number five did the whole planetary adventure thing very well, and I'm certainly interested in other works by Gwyneth Jones now. Also, mentally, the main character had me think of Saxton Hale from Team Fortress 2's story, and I just kind of thought that was funny. Six out of 16 is Living Hell by Joe Haldeman. Similar to Planet of Fear, I found the portrayed world in the story to be more interesting than the story itself. The Venus described is alive, in the sense that it has life on it, but it perhaps is one of the most brutal portrayals within the book. The description is indeed like a living hell, a planet with steam storms swirling at the equator and just brutal atmospheric conditions, but covered in plant life. It was also the first to set up in my mind what must be another of the writing prompts for these stories. Brutal native life. Somewhat like, but not exactly like, dinosaurs whose potential lethality is very high. It's another SF trope that <sighs> everything has used all the way up to Cameron's Not Dances with Wolves avatar. The brutal survival setting involving the main character 
generally venturing down to try and save the small colony of women was all right. Namely the ending, that Venus is alive and that anything that it is attacked or killed there can regenerate completely with its memories is neat, I guess. Largely I felt the concept would have had more done with it, and the ending was largely not as interesting as, you know, the places that we went through to get there. Bones of Air, Bones of Stone is the seventh story, and it's written by Stephen Lee. It is, I think, while not a favorite personally, very well done. When it comes to running a short story, you have such a tight amount of time to say and do things, and it's not really a lot. You need to do your best within that narrow margin. Bones of Air, Bones of Stone is, I think, maybe one of the book's best examples of that balancing act. The story, about a crippled ex-lover returning to Venus to find both the place and person who caused him that pain, is already a neat one. The portrayed Venus as well has the fishmen. Several stories in the book have this trope, but this one really kind of presented them with a level of detail and just general depth. Haha, <laughs> yes I know. In terms of that culture, the aquatic religion that takes central focus is what the ex-lover is set on quite literally getting to the bottom of. But I also I think hit a good note of these adventuring affluent types who go anywhere and do anything based on the raw test of skill, ignoring what the actual local cultures of the places who live in those extremes think or believe. Just ignoring them, and just to do so to add a notch to one's belt in terms of triumphing over some supposedly impossible geographic hurdle. It's got colonial themes, it's got wetness, and I think for the Venus story it does do something really interesting. So yeah, it's a very strong story, and one of the standouts in this collection, if not a personal favorite. Moving on is Story 8, Ruins by Eleanor Arneson. With this kind of a Heart of Darkness style setup that many stories in here kind of use. A dangerous expedition, and the journey to some unforsaken place. I found this version of Venus to be very similar to the now emerging template, but it had a good element of distinctive character. My main problems are mainly that it exhibited that same trait which seemed to emerge and to be in plenty all over the collection of overly describing the local wildlife as almost dinosaur-like but not, and just generally having an ending that I feel did not really wholeheartedly weigh in enough for its setup. I cannot say it's a bad story, or even poor. That's fine, it just seemed to be building to something either more within the scale of stories like US-Russian and capitalism-communism conflicts, or something perhaps more grandiose. It's a hard criticism for me to really pin down, it's just a general feeling of ending the story and kind of going, oh, I guess that was it. The ninth story is also another of my favorites, The Tumble Downs of Cleopatra Abyss. This one was fantastic for basically doing a few things pretty well. One, it's an interregnum story, basically a primitive society that likely once had spacefaring technology but has since lost it and pretty much most other tech as well. It's one of Martin's favorite story types and I love it as well. It's not really post-apocalyptic, it's been so many hundreds or thousands of years later that even the apocalypse seems nothing more than a distant legend. It's a fun story to set another atypical but interesting setting that did try to hit the basic setup roughly, but did its own thing as well. A series of underwater bunker city globe things, similar to perhaps the book City of Ember, and that this might be all that's left of humankind. It's kind of inferred that the traditions that kept the bunkers going so long are not going to work well much longer. The main characters are a newlywed couple dealing with that classical new marital issue, catastrophic submarine failure. So yeah, it's fun. I would say more, but I think I'll leave it at that. It's another favorite. Number 10's wordy name, by Frog Sled and Lizardback to Outcast Venusian Lepers, is by an author who I have actually read from, Garth Nix. One of those names that seems plainly derived by English language, yet also 100% facetious in origin. It's another Heart of Darkness style run into the jungles of Venus this time with some interesting twists. I'd say it's another story that did take its wet and wild setting and kind of ran with it to someplace interesting. The world felt larger and that was neat, but I am kind of left sort of half cooked by the ending. It's not bad, it serves the story well, it's just this one feels like one of those intros that could easily launch you into a much bigger story and scope, but then sort of has to cram itself back in like a poorly folded sleeping bag into the conclusion a few pages later. It does, however, show you some good scenery. So yeah, not my favorite, but solid for what it is worth, just a little wonky. Eleven is Sunset of Time by Michael Cassett, probably another one of my five favorite stories in this collection. It does what I think exemplified the better stories in here. It went further and did more with the setup of the concept of Old Venus 
and simply being another hell swamp jungle world filled with ultra tigers. It's Venus, colonized by a Victorian-ish American British society, thankfully lacking the lingual annoyance of Greaves and the Morning Star. It's a genuinely interesting setting. The juxtaposition of cultures between the two peoples, the humans striving for completion of a massive industrial project headed and designed by the main character, and the disassembling of the locals as they break down the civilization to prepare for a world-shaking cataclysm works for interesting setup. Then that contrasted on the other level with the love triangle of the main character, his friend, and his romantic interest. It added a good example of the story and the story type in general, setting up a good level of parallels between the larger and smaller conflicts. And so yeah, in general, it's a very good story in that its characters feel fleshed out well, and in the rough short time, it feels like more than just a pulpy science or adventure, biff punch, good archetype kind of deal. It's a world that feels genuinely an anachronistic colonization attempt from the early 1900s, without being another jungle hell or steampunk shit show. So yeah, big thumbs up. Perhaps the work that I'm still most on the fence about though is the next one, Tobias S. Buckle's Pale Blue Memories. It's a hard work to get around in terms of plot if I don't really spell it out and spell out the main crux. A crew of Americans and a crew of Germans, sometime around World War II, race rockets to Venus. The Germans fire some kind of weapon and both rockets crash. The main character, Charles, is a Jamaican descendant of mixed race from the United States. Eventually, the entire expedition is taken captive by the native Venusians, who then sell them into what largely amounts to slavery working in the local Venusian city docks. The proud Nazis are also taken captive, attempt to escape, and are more or less killed, as are basically everyone else in the American crew except for Charles. Charles, I guess, channels his cultural heritage and understanding of slavery from his father and his grandfather to essentially survive and subsist in slavery on Venus. The end. So yeah, I don't know. On the one hand, I like that it kind of hilariously does a Planet of the Apes thing and has the Phanusians not play this kind of typical captive, subjugated natives instead easily overpowering both German and American expeditions that more pulpy stories would have triumph. But on the other hand, I'm kind of left with, uh, how do I put this, bad Star Trek morality episode feeling, where the core message seems uh, just kind of blunt. It's a weird one, one of those stories I bump into which at times looking at it makes you feel interesting and maybe really good, yet rolling around also seemingly makes it feel kind of simple or stupid. So yeah, I can't say. It's neat, it's not generic in the stylings of the more average stories, but as to how good of a story it is, eh, I'm really fucking 50-50 on it. Number 13 is The Heart's Filthy Lesson by Elizabeth Bear. It's another in my five favorites. It's weird. It took the jungle and rain and wet prompts and really went someplace freaky. It feels neat in that genuine science fiction way, in that shit, this is weird way. In its simplest sense, it's a very straightforward survival story about the main character trying to make it to some potentially alien ruins. However, the main character is also a genetically altered descendant human wrapped in a living survival suit made uh, out of flesh or plastic or some such. It's like Survivor Man if it was actually survivor woman post-human thing against the strangeness of the place. I really enjoyed it. It was also well focused in the sense that short stories should be. Not too big, not too small. Very good. A nice and personal, so yeah, very well done and definitely very enjoyable for me. 14 is Wizard of the Trees by Joe R. Lansdale. Generally, it was kind of dull. Yeah, it's a story that basically played the whole pulp planetary romance straight, but without any big interesting twists or anything that really stuck out to me. I mean, yeah, I, I really don't have much more to say. It's got flying sleds. It's got birdman fights. It's got strong Earthmen. It's probably something I'd enjoy more in comic book form, honestly. The Godstone of Venus is number 15, and it's written by Mike Resnick. It's an interesting setup, basically a sort of buddy mystery where the seasoned guide and his psychic ape partner agree to escort a suspicious pair of a gambler and a strange alien woman deep into the jungle. It's neat, and it does the descent into the heart of jungle thing again. Largely, it's another fine little story, but not one that overtly felt different enough to really stick with me or impress me outside of the psychic ape character who had some genuinely funny moments and setups. A neat story, but not strong. Finally, this takes us to the last story and my final favorite of the bunch. A strong ending for sure. Botanica Veneria by Ian MacDonald. Already the framing device of this story makes it inherently pretty neat. 
an exhibition of cut paper flowers presented alongside the scattered pages of a journal of the original artist. It's set long in the past, recounting her adventures across Venus in the pursuit of her lost brother. Creatively, it had already got me with the setup, but like any setup, it's a commitment to carry out what you're using. Nicely enough, this story does, and it does so well. It's a version of Venus I think that's probably one of the most detailed and rich in the collection, presenting many factions and many nations and regions. It shakes off that Star Wars curse of planets being this monoclimate of the jungle swampy kind of variety, and the rest of the book also somewhat has that issue. Instead, this one imbues the setting with a real diversity of locales and the main character goes through all of it. The stories that they encounter are also very rich and different. It's a really strong ending and another recommendation from this collection. So yeah, there we have it. All 16 stories in the collection. For the price I paid, I'd say it was a neat grouping, and I will for sure look into Martin's edited Old Mars stories as well. Once again, if you like, have a look at my attempt down below, and I don't know, maybe buy the book and laugh at how bad my story attempt is in comparison. But yeah, it's a neat and specific prompt to deal with. And if this mostly still video does not impress you, don't worry, the next one will focus entirely on animation.